So with that introduction under our belts, uh, we're going to move now into uh, the four uh, main segments of this module. We're going to talk about how to describe collaboration networks. When we talk about collaboration patterns, we're going to focus specifically on thinking about it in terms of networks. And then later, we'll move into mapping, how to map collaboration networks, how to evaluate them, and how to intervene. So moving into segment two, how do we describe uh, collaboration networks? So what I'm going to do in this uh, segment is to introduce you to a number of building blocks that can basically provide some vocabulary, some terminology for analyzing collaboration networks. But let's um, make sure that we understand exactly where we're coming from, because I went and introduced you to the idea of networks pretty fast. So what are organizational networks, just to make sure we, we really get this? So let me show you first a picture that is going to look like many pictures that you're probably familiar with. So this is a formal structure um, of an organization. It's basically an organizational chart. Um, it's a real organizational chart. It comes from the exploration and production division of a large um, petrochemical company. Um, and uh, this is the senior executives who uh, and their reporting structure inside this organization. So you can see who reports to whom. Just like the organizations that many of you will be working for, you'll probably um, recognize, you know, you have a reporting structure, that, an, an organization chart that looks something like this in most organizations, right? But when we talk about an organizational network, we mean something a little bit different. For this particular uh, organization, this exploration and production division, we can draw an organizational network that tells us who actually interacts with whom. Who actually collaborates with whom in this organization? Not who's supposed to collaborate with whom or who formally reports to whom, but who actually interacts with whom. And the network that you can see when you draw this kind of a chart is really quite different from the one that you see in the formal organizational chart. So if you take um, Cole, who's at the center of the informal network, you see if you look at the formal structure, the organizational chart, Cole is way down there on the side in the reporting structure, right? But in the organizational network, he's very, very central. That means many people are coming to him, um, and he's probably communicating and interacting with many people to get his work done. So we see quite a different structure, and it sort of draws attention to some people that we might not notice as much if we're only looking at the formal organizational chart. So we have the formal structure, but when we're talking about organizational networks, we're really talking about the informal structure of the organization, who actually works with whom. It's worth noting that there are many different kinds of organizational networks. So we're going to be focusing um, throughout this module on collaboration networks, which might be how you know who shares information with whom, how information flows around the network, who shares knowledge with whom. But we could draw networks that are simply based on who talks to whom, communication, uh, who's friendly with whom, who, where friendship ties, who gives advice to whom, who trusts whom. So there are many different, and there, there could be many others, there are many different um, bases for drawing network maps. But we're really focusing on collaboration networks here. So the kinds of ties that we're interested in are collaborations between employees inside organizations. So back to the example of a collaboration network that I showed you in the previous segment. So again, if you remember, there are 15 people in this uh, new product development team. They're in three different parts of the organization, but they're working together um, to get things done and often seeking information from each other in order to get their work done. So I want to take a minute to ask you to think about this question. Just looking at this network, who do you think you might want to be and why? So if you look at the network, who do you think you might want to be in that network? And what would be your reasons? And just take a second to think about that. So a quick reaction, you know, if you're looking at this network for the first time, might well be, well, you know, I think I might want to be Paul. Or maybe I want to be Helen in this network, right? And why would we say Paul or Helen? Probably because, you know, they're very central. They look pretty important in this network. They're in the middle of all the action. They've got lots of people coming to them, and maybe they're going to um, quite a few people themselves. Um, and, and so there's, they're in the middle of where it's happening, right? And so that seems like maybe a good network position um, to be in. But can you think of any reasons why you wouldn't want to be Paul or Helen? Why is it not a good idea sometimes to be in the middle of a network? So one possible reason that you might be thinking if you actually you know, have a lot of people coming to you for, uh, for information or advice, might be, well, it actually takes a lot of time. <laughs> when a lot of people are knocking on your door and asking you all the time for things that they need, it takes away from your um, structured work time. So that might be one reason, right? So maybe you're feeling a little bit overloaded if you're central in the network. Now, somebody you might not have wanted to be, if you think about who would you least want to be in this network, right? Who would you least want to be? If you look at the map, 
probably pretty quickly you might say, well, I wouldn't want to be Kevin, right? Kevin's pretty isolated out there. He's all by himself, right? Nobody's talking to him. He's not talking to anybody. It doesn't seem like it's much fun to be Kevin. And that's probably true. Kevin seems pretty cut off. Now, why might Kevin like being cut off, right? Why might this actually be in some ways an advantageous position? Well, you know, it's not good to be out of the network flows, but everybody's leaving Kevin alone. Maybe Kevin just gets on with his job, really enjoys what he's doing, has plenty of time to get things done. So these are just some very initial intuitions, but what they start pointing us towards is this idea that, you know, where you are positioned in a collaboration network really matters. So the structure of that network and your position in that network is going to matter a lot for you to get your work done and for, you know, how overloaded you feel, how satisfied you feel, whether you enjoy being in the workplace, lots of different things. So when we look at a network map like this, there's a lot going on and we can get a little bit of an intuition about it. But what I want to do is to build in some real um, basic building blocks here to help us look at this kind of a network with more analytic rigor and think about, okay, so what are the specific things that we can learn when we look at even a simple uh, kind of a network like this? And this is a pretty simple network. It's only 15 people. So let's move towards thinking about how can we describe um, these collaboration patterns? And I'm going to introduce you to five building blocks, network size, strength, range, density, and centrality. Okay, and we're going to work through each of these one by one. And I'm going to just use a very simple form of a network to help, um, help you understand the basic idea um, behind each of these, because they're all different ways to describe even the kind of network that we just looked at, as well as more complex networks inside organizations. So let's look at network size. So building blocks first, there's a building block. Network size. Okay, so building block one, network size is very straightforward, right? We've got two people, two employees in our organization, say Sarah and Ted, right? And what we're doing here is we're mapping the number of people that they collaborate with or that they go to and get exchange information with, right? And we can see that Sarah goes to five other people or has collaborative ties with five people. Ted, on the other hand, has collaborative ties with eight people. Right? So Ted has a larger network um, than Sarah. Very basic. Um, generally, is it a good idea to have a larger network? Yeah, it's probably a good idea when your network's relatively small. The more people that you're connected to, the more information you're going to be getting and so on. Um, if your network starts getting really large, though, maybe you don't want more and more people. So there's no, nothing to say that anything that there's a particular network size that's good or bad at this point. We're just saying, how do we describe networks? Well, we can describe them in terms of the number of people you're connected to, in terms of its size. Now, here's the second building block. This is network strength. OK, so if you look at this network, here we have Sarah and Ted, and they both have five uh, network ties, five connections to people that they're collaborating with. But the thicker lines mean that the ties are stronger. Right? And so what you see is even though they both have five connections, um, Sarah's ties, four out of five of them, are really pretty strong ties. Whereas Ted's ties, only one of them is a strong tie. The others are relatively weak ties. Um, and that can matter. Strong ties can be really advantageous. You can really build trust with those people. You can exchange information with them a lot. You can believe what they say. Um, but it also takes a lot of time to maintain um, strong relationships. So trade-offs again in network strength. So we've got network size and network strength are two important uh, building blocks here. Again, we have stronger ties, we have weaker ties. The third building block is network range. So network range is a measure of how many different groups you're connected to. So here, Sarah and Ted both have five um, uh, collaborators or five people that they can turn to, exchange information with. But Sarah, say Sarah works in marketing in the marketing department, all of Sarah's five connections are within the marketing department. Whereas Ted is connected to someone in the marketing department, but he's also connected to somebody, say the red dot is R&D, and the blue dot is human resources, and the green dot is um, finance, and the, the, the yellow dot is operations, right? So Ted has a much, a much wider network range, right? He has a high range network, whereas Sarah's is a low range network. And when you have higher network range, you're connected to many more different sources of information, right? So your ability to get information from different sources, from a wider range of sources, is much greater. So that's the third building block. The fourth building block is network density. So this is getting a little bit more complicated here. So network density, you start with, just for simplicity's sake, Sarah and Ted both have five people that they uh, exchange information with. 
But now what I'm going to do is give both Sarah and Ted, each of the people that they're connected to, I want to give each of those people five people that they exchange information with. And you can see some quite different patterns emerge. So I'm going to give each of Sarah's connections five connections of their own. What I'm giving them is the same five people as exist already in Sarah's network. So each of those people is connected to each other. And that's what we call a very dense network. On the other hand, I'm going to give Ted's five people, five people that they're connected to. Actually, I'm going to give them four, five people they're connected to, but they're all connected to really different people, right? So each of them has five different people that they're connected to. And so you can see really different patterns in this network as a result of the way that their second order connections work, the friends of their friend or the connections of their connection. So Sarah has a high density network where everybody knows each other, basically. And Ted has a low density network where really Ted is at the center and the people around the edges really don't know each other at all. So again, there can be benefits to a high density versus a low density network, right? So if you're in a high density network where everybody knows each other, that has some advantages. There's a lot of trust in that kind of a network because if somebody tells you information, you can easily confirm with your other friends whether that information's right or not. But in a but in a high density network, you don't, you know, you only have those five people to give you information. If you are in a low density network, Ted has a huge advantage in the sense of he has access not only to the five people that he has connections with, but those five people are getting information from an additional, in this case, four people each. And so they're getting a lot of extra information in that doesn't exist in the high density network. So in a low density network, you have access to a lot of uh, more information, but you don't have a lot of that trust and verification because somebody could tell you something and you have no way to verify whether that, per whether that source is reliable. You have nobody else who's connected to them. So that's a high density versus a low density network. And then the last building block, um, which is very related, is the idea of network centrality. So Sarah um, and all her contacts are all equally central in their networks. They all are connected to the same number of other people, and they're all connected to the same set of other people. So they're all equally central. But you can quickly see that Ted's network, there's a lot of variation in who's most central. Ted is most central there. He really basically has uh, you know, access to all the information in that sort of hub and spoke system. The people that he's connected directly to are moderately central, um, but the people that they're connected to are relatively peripheral. They only have basically access to you know, one of Ted's friends. So centrality, we had that, those intuitive ideas about centrality right from the beginning when we looked at our new product development team. Here we can see that centrality is actually something we can measure and track and that it has different implications um, depending on the configuration and um, the structure of your network. So back to our example of this collaboration network, you see um, some, some, you know, these, these five building blocks give us a different way to think about um, or a more rigorous way to analyze uh, the uh, network features um, for each individual in this network, right? So we can ask for each of these individuals, what's the size of their network, right? It's pretty clear that Paul has a pretty large network and Kevin has a pretty small network, right? And we got that just by looking at this map in the first place. We can look at network strength and whether those ties are strong and perhaps you know, two-directional or whether they're pretty weak. Um, we can look at network range. So if you think about that, who has the highest range in this network? So remember, range is about how many different parts of the organization, for example, or different groups you're connected to. So here, it's pretty clear that Paul has the highest network range, right? Because Paul is connected, he's in finance, and he's connected to people who are both in manufacturing um, and in marketing. And nobody else is connected to all three groups in that way. So he has the highest range. If you think about density, who has the densest network? So one of those groups where everybody knows everybody. So Helen's network looks pretty dense, right? Whereas Paul's network is pretty sparse, right? Paul doesn't have a lot of people who know each other. Paul's one of those very central people in a network that's pretty sparse. Helen is a pretty central person in a network that's pretty dense. So they're both high in centrality. Um, Helen's network is denser than Paul's network just by eyeballing this. And these are numbers that we can calculate in their formulae for actually calculating um, how dense and how uh, a network is and how central um, people are in their networks. So when we think about this question of who do you want to be in this network and why, we can actually apply these building blocks, analytic building blocks, to start understanding and comparing across individuals um, to understand their network positions. 
So those are the basic building blocks for understanding uh, and describing collaboration networks. As we're going to move forward, we're going to think about how to map those networks. How do we generate a network map that helps us to see who is doing what and who is collaborating with whom inside an organization that we want to study?